I came to Portland uh, first time in 91, and I decided I really wanted to move here and live here. And one of the reasons that I came to Oregon um, was I just felt at home. And in part of that, you know, it's got beautiful countryside, it rains a lot, just like England, so I feel very comfortable. But also the transportation was one of the things that drew me here. It felt the public transport infrastructure is one of the things that made me feel like I was in a little bit of Europe. So thank you for that. Uh, I came for an 18-month assignment, and that was 18 years ago, and I never went home. So very happy to be in Oregon, and I'm very glad that I made it my home. Um, I started as a, as we all do, as a little kid, and I used to climb trees, and I used to run around in bright green corduroys. They were flared. It was the 70s. I was cool. And I would be, I was a normal kid. I used to ride my bike and have a great time um, until something happened to me. I became obsessed with the future. And it happened because my dad was a physicist. He worked at a university, and I was very lucky that he would bring computers home from work. And in, you know, now, 10-year-old kids, they all have computers. They have multiple. Back in the 70s, this is, I'm talking when Star Wars came out here, if you want to do the math to figure out how old I am. Um, back then, when I was 10 years old, it was unusual to have access to computers. But I, I used to love playing with them. I became very pale. I never went outside. Uh, and I would just sit in front of this green flickering screen, because it was just one color then. They all came in green. And I did that because I was just fascinated by what you could create with them. And then, even though I was a 10-year-old kid, I could tell that these were going to change the world. And I think in that moment, I was sort of setting myself on this path to become a futurist. But what does it mean? What the heck is a futurist? It means I think about what's the world going to feel like to live in 10, 12, 15, 20 years from now. And I, I, to figure that out, I have to think about multiple factors. I don't just go into a dark room and smoke a lot of weed, and, you know, which I, I know is a thing here in Oregon. I don't do it. But, um, and come up with amazing uh, views of the future. That would be one way to do it, I suppose. But you have to really think about many factors when you're trying to model the future. So I have a crystal ball, obviously. I'm a futurist. That's what I do. I try not ever to make predictions about the future. My job is to figure out what the possibilities will be in any given time frame and then help people think through what do we do with that given what might be possible in that time frame. So there's three important pieces to thinking about what the future will look like. The first one is you know, what you'd expect. Um, you need to think about technology trends. I work for Intel. I look at the, the world through the lens of computing. Um, you would expect me to think about technology trends. They are very disruptive and they have for the last you know, many years, shaped the modern lives that we live in. So of course, when you're thinking about the future, you need to be thinking about technology developments, and not just when a technology will be available and possible, but when will it be low cost enough and available enough to have mass impact on real people. All right, so the second thing is you have to be thinking not just about the technology, but about business trends, ecosystem trends, what is happening in the world that this technology will diffuse into. Self-driving cars are a great example of that. Three years from now, technology should be solid enough. From the, from the smart people I speak to in those industries, at car companies and technology companies, three years from now, it'll be solid enough to, to be deployed. Will it happen in volume in three years? No. It won't happen because we have to figure out how the insurance companies feel, to figure out how Organizations like ODOT feel about it. We have, to, we have to figure out liability issues. So all of those things, all of those business elements, what happens with regulation, um, all matter in the deployment of new technology. But there's a third and perhaps most important piece of thinking about the future, and that is thinking about people. What do people want? What do they love? What are they scared of? What are they excited about? What are they... What are their aspirations? What are their challenges in life? So as well as being a technologist by training and having spent almost 30 years in Intel's business, I've also spent a lot of time with a group of people at Intel who are cultural anthropologists, social scientists, ethnographers, who spend time in people's lives understanding what do they want, what do they love, what are they scared about. They will actually go out into people's homes or their cars and look at what does that world look like? 
It's all well and good deploying new technology, but if you don't understand how people really live their lives, you're not going to get it right. So they will literally go to people and they will have them empty out the contents of their cars. They, they put a, a white sheet on the ground. They, people have people empty them out onto the sheet. They lay them all out and take pictures of them to understand what is the world that devices and other technologies going into. It's not just the car. People's cars are a petri dish of stuff that they carry around with them. If you think about your car, maybe you're a neat freak and have nothing in it. I bet you do. I bet you've got lots of stuff. So understanding that, understanding how people use technology, how they use products, how they live their lives is vital. You put all of those together, that helps you build a model of the future. If you're just looking at one of those in isolation, you're not going to get a really true picture. So that's what I do. That's my job, is to think about all those things and try and put them together. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the human trends. What do people want? Um, what are the trends we're seeing amongst different groups? And you heard from Sue, some attitudinal stuff. Um, I'll talk about human trends a little bit because it's a setup, I think, for some of the technology stuff. I'm guessing you're interested to hear from the futurist who works for Intel uh, what the technology trends are going to be. So we'll spend most of our time there. All right, so some of the human trends. The first one is there is a trend to people wanting to own less stuff, to have less ownership in their life. And this, is, this started because objects were becoming digitized. And people got used to the idea. I, mean, I, I was a DJ when I was in college. I was serious into music. I had 3,000 CDs. And they took up a lot of space. And it weighed a lot. And now I got rid of them all. Because now music is a service for $10 a month. That's why I use Spotify. So I got used to the idea that suddenly I don't need to own music. I can just pay to have access to it. So you're seeing this move towards less ownership. You're seeing, especially in the millennial generation, so Gen Ys, you're seeing people wanting to own less stuff, have less burden in their lives. And this is not just something that's happening with Gen Ys. Airbnb, the idea that you can go and stay in someone's home and pay them for the evening to go and share that experience with them, or when they're gone, you have the whole place. That is most popular amongst Gen Xs. So this is not just a Gen Y thing. So there's generally a move towards less ownership. This is important when you're thinking about the future of transportation. Here's a stat that brings this to life. If you are not a Gen Y and you read this, it will make your head hurt. So let me read it to you. More than one-third of U.S. millennials would rather pay full price to access an item rather than own it. If you are a Gen X or older than that, that is mind-blowingly odd. Why wouldn't you want to own something? Owning is cool. Owning is something that people like to, because we like to show status by ownership. Not anymore. That is changing, and it's changing rapidly. It is now gauche to try and own certain categories of product. It is not aspirational for a whole generation. And that matters a lot when you're thinking about car ownership of the future. The other thing that we're seeing, particularly amongst uh, Gen Z, and to some extent Gen Y, is a very strong desire to have more customized products. Customized products and either personalized or customized experiences. Technology is going to change in the next 10 years, making it much easier for us to be able to deliver customized products. You're seeing, seeing it happen to some extent already. You can buy your Nike sneakers with, you know, you choose the colors. But it, was, it is completely reasonable with the developments we're seeing with robotics. And um, DARPA is actually funding a scheme to have uh, robotic sewing machines that can make a whole garment without any human interaction. If that comes to fruition, it will be completely reasonable 10 years time to be able to go into a store and say, I want that shirt, but I want it in this color, and I want it in my size in five minutes. Now, in a world where customization is expected, how will you think about delivering your services in a customized manner? Because that will become the expectation of an entire generation, and once a generation is driving that, and remember globally, the millennials are a large generation. They are 2 billion people. This is going to become the norm. So expect more customization and personalization of experiences. The difference between customization and personalization, because people use the two interchangeably. They're not the same thing. Customization is when I go in and say, I want that, but I want it in green. 
I am, I am expressing my choice. That is customization. You're building to my custom specifications. Personalization is when I walk in and you have figured out, based on who I am, maybe your knowledge of me, my, my purchasing habits over time, you have an understanding of me, and you make choices on my behalf using that understanding. That is personalization. So if you think about your recommendations list from Amazon, that is a personalized service based on your previous um, purchase history. So expect more customization, more personalization being the expectation and the norm going forward. Thinking about that in a transportation context, I'd, I want you to just know what my schedule is for the day. And I would like you, please, to provide me a service that gets me from A to B to C to D and home again on my schedule, on time. Can you figure that out for me? And by the way, you know what kind of person I am and how much I'm willing to spend for that, so you know I want the, the nicer cars. To... Can you do that? That's the kind of expectation that you need to be meeting 10, 15, 20 years from now. Maybe much sooner. So if you illustrate this point, 79% of Americans aged 15 to 35 want to buy customized products. This is an absolute expectation. It is an unfulfilled desire today. This is part of a broader change that we are seeing where power is moving to the consumer. It is moving to the individual. Technology is empowering people to do things that they didn't do before. If you wanted to have a voice 20 years ago, you needed to go to journalism school, work for a really poor circulation local newspaper, then work your way up, and eventually, after 25, 30 years, maybe you could work for the New York Times and have a voice. Now you can start your blog, and if it's good enough and people, people find it, you'll have a big voice, perhaps bigger than some of the people who have worked for 40 years in journalism. So publishing got completely changed. That power got distributed. That's about to happen with manufacturing. Local manufacturing capability, local design capabilities that connect people to a manufacturing cloud in China and India and Indonesia and wherever else it needs to be will be able to design their own products, become entrepreneurs, and have them shipped everywhere in the world without ever having to touch those products. Completely changes the dynamic when it comes to manufacturing and the power for, for entrepreneurs. The barriers to entry for new companies who want to create a new product just went away. Energy is going to be similar. Today, if you want to be in the energy business, you're PG&E. You have you know, multi-billion dollar investments. That doesn't have to be that way. People will be able to make their own energy and start selling to the smart energy grid. And if Elon Musk comes out with some uh, grid-level batteries, as has been potentially um, hypothesized in this week, we may see that change everything, making it easy to now store the energy that you make to sell it to your neighbors. It may, may not need to be connected to the grid anymore. That could change everything. Transportation, we are seeing change from being something you own to being potentially a service. We'll talk more about that. And education, you can now get access to education in a way you couldn't before because of all these online training courses. Look at what Coursera is doing as an example. So power is becoming distributed to individuals. Power that is in centralized organizations is being distributed. You are a centralized organization. Think about what that means for you in the next five, 10, 20 years. If you are a millennial, if you are aged 18 to 35, one of the things that drives you in your decisions you make is a desire for less friction in your life. What I mean by that is, a millennial will be loyal to your brand. They will use your product, they will use your service, and they will be ambassadors for your brand up until the very moment where somebody else offers them a way of doing it with one less click, one less footstep, one less piece of effort on their part, and then they will switch, and they'll switch forever. Because what they care about is efficiency. They really care about sustainability, but they care about efficiency. They want everything to be as efficient as possible. And that is something that you're all gonna have to think about. How do you deliver that? How do you make it so that it is easy for people to use your services? There is no pain. You move every little bit of an obstacle, in using your service, get it out of the way. So there is zero friction. It's probably one of the most important things you can think about as you're developing services of the future. 
We've all been sold a great fantasy about driving and how it is. Right? We've seen the car commercials. And when we buy our cars, this is what we think about. The open road, maybe the wind in our hair, not in my case, but... We have this fantasy of the way driving is, and ever since you know, the post-World War II era, particularly in America, the car became a symbol of freedom. And if you had a car, you were free because you were mobile. You could go where you wanted, do what you wanted. Cars are a symbol of freedom for Gen Xs and for boomers. They are not a symbol of freedom if you are millennial, if you're Gen Y or below. In fact, they're the opposite because that's the fantasy. This is the reality of driving today. It's not much fun. And not only is it no fun to actually drive, you also have to worry about parking your damn car, you gotta think about your insurance, your maintenance. For a millennial, their attitude to driving is completely different. They don't wanna deal with it. You wonder why they're interested in public transport? Because owning cars sucks. And it's also, to my point about efficiency and less friction, it is not an efficient way to get around. I've seen estimates of you know, anything between 54 minutes a day and 105 minutes a day being the amount of time that the average American car is used. Most of the time, that very expensive resource is sat there doing nothing, depreciating, rusting. So there has to be a different way to do this. And if you're a millennial, car ownership no longer makes sense. I live in the Pearl District downtown in Portland. I've been there since 2000, watched all these buildings grow up around me. They're now putting another 700 units into the Pearl District. Many of those apartment buildings have parking garages in them. There'll be a building that has 130, 140 units, 70 parking spaces. Now, if you'd done that 10 years ago, people would have thought that was crazy. And right now, it is still crazy. And I'm really worried about how, many, how much parking there's going to be in the Pearl. But 10 years from now, I think it's going to be fine because the people living in those places will not want to own a car and there will be other options for them. That's exciting because we're seeing more people every day coming into cities. You probably have a better view on the local stats for the you know, Oregon, um, state of Oregon than I do, but globally we are going to see two and a half billion more people moving into cities between now and 2050. Two and a half billion people, well that's a big number, how many is that actually? That is equivalent to 170,000 people per day, every day between now and 2050, moving into cities around the world. That is, 170,000 people is more than the entire population of Salem. So we're gonna be crushing more and more people into urban environments, and we're gonna have to move them around to keep them mobile, we're gonna have to keep bringing food and other supplies in and taking waste out. And we're going to need creative transportation policies to help us do that. And that's going to require technology because crushing another two, two and a half billion people into urban centers when we're having cities of 30, 40, 50 million people trying to live together, not sustainable unless we do transportation differently. Now you're thinking, well, that's not, that's not Oregon. That's, we don't have that. And to some extent, that's true. We have a lot of people living in rural, and Portland is a small city by, by global standards. But these technologies are going to get developed to solve problems five, 10,000 miles away from here. And you will be able to take advantage of that and make Portland and make Oregon an even more livable space than it is today. Because you can take advantage of what is happening globally. So that's all I wanted to talk about with regards to human trends, to sort of the set the scene for what, what are the trends that I see happening that are going to shape people's attitudes to transportation and to other sectors as well. Uh, I do a lot of work in retail and healthcare, uh, as Mark mentioned, and uh, I'm seeing this disruption come to every single sector. And it's exciting, but if you're not used to disruption in your sector, it's a little bit scary too. So I, I'm... I'm suggesting that you embrace a lot of this change. This is a great opportunity to think about transportation differently and to free yourself. And I know there's, gonna, there's been a lot of discussion this morning about funding challenges. I want to 
bring some ideas about how to get around that using technology. So stay tuned in the next 10 minutes or so for that. Let's start with tech trends. Um, I work for a computing company, and I would therefore obviously argue that computing has changed the world. And it's changed the world in ways big and small. How many of you have one of these little suckers in your pocket? Right? Most of you have one, I would imagine, yeah. Pocket or purse, you have a smartphone of some sort. That wasn't something that anybody even thought about 10 years ago. iPhone was released in 2007. Here we are in 2015, just eight years later. And suddenly, that's completely changed the way people live their lives. You're no longer bored. You're no longer lonely. You're no longer um, lost. Right? Those are the three things it gives you. <laughs> you always have something to do. So technology has changed our, in our lives in ways big and small. Um, the internet has connected people across the world. It's made businesses more efficient. Um, and it's not just the technology products that have changed our lives. It's also how technology has been used to develop other categories of products. H hands up, who brushed their teeth this morning? OK. Thankfully, most of you, that's good. So I would guess that the toothbrush that you used this morning was not whittled by, out of wood by some old lady that lives in Clackamas County. I'm guessing. I'm guessing it was mass produced in a factory that was run by computers. And it was designed so that the bristles are angled perfectly just to get that little bit of plaque off the back corner there by somebody using a computer. So computing has completely transformed our lives in the last 50 years. What I want to tell you today is it is going to transform your life perhaps more in the next 10 years than the last 50 combined. And when it comes to transportation, that's absolutely true. We're living in an era of Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is this idea po uh, posited by um, Intel co-founder Gordon Moore. And it's actually the 50th anniversary last week of Moore's Law. So back in 1965, Gordon Moore made an observation in a scientific paper that was published in Electronics Magazine that the number of transistors that went onto a microchip was doubling. And at the time, it was doubling every year or so. And he thought that would continue to double, he thought, for the next 10 years. And he later modified that prediction to say that the number of transistors would double every two years. And here we are 50 years later, and it's still true. Now, why does that matter? You're probably thinking, what's an esoteric? What's a transistor? I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. Transistors are to microchips the same way that cells are to our body. They're the basic building block. The more transistors you have, the more capable your chip is, the more graphics and more security and more USB ports, whatever it might be. So more transistors is good. The other thing that happens when you make transistors smaller is they switch on and off faster. So that's why we've gone from chips that ran on kilohertz to now gigahertz. It doesn't matter. It just, they go faster. In fact, they go about 3,500 times faster than they did when we first started this journey. So transistors, as they get smaller, you can get more of them onto a chip, so you can do more stuff. They go faster. They also consume less power, and they get cheaper. So it's like a quadruple whammy of goodness. And this is going to continue. Because what, what Gordon said was, whatever can be done can be outdone. So this is really hard stuff to do. Making these transistors smaller, they are so small that you can't see them with the human eye. They are about 14 nan nanometers across. This is about 14 billionths of a meter. And you think, well, I don't know how small that is, Steve. It just sounds very small. That's fine. To give you a feel for how small it is, when we first started out, the transistors that we were making were about the size of the eraser at the end of a pencil. Now, that was about back in 1971, the first microprocessor. Since then, we've shrunk them down to the point where now you can fit six million of them inside the period at the end of a sentence. If you'd done the same kind of shrinking with your car, your car would now be the size of an ant. And because they've got more efficient, this is what allows supercomputers that would have filled this room in the mid-1990s to now, you know, the, the most powerful supercomputers in the world in the mid-90s are now as powerful as your phone. Because we've not only shrunk those transistors down like a car to an ant, but if we'd done the same thing in terms of efficiency, 
your car would run your entire life on one tank of gas. That's the power of Moore's law. That's why it's been so profound as an impact on our lives. It's going to continue. And the thing about Moore's law is it is exponential in nature. Brains think linearly. It is not easy to think exponentially. To think exponentially allows you to make huge leaps forward and to make business decisions that seem on the surface to be crazy. Think about what the Google boys did. Do you remember when they came out, I don't know, 10 years ago, with Gmail? And they said, we're going to give everybody a gigabyte of storage. And everybody said, How? you can't do that. You're going to go out of business. You're crazy. Who's going to need a gigabyte? What they understood was Moore's Law would take care of that. That a gigabyte, when they announced it, was a crazy amount of storage to give people. Now, it's hardly anything. That's the, that's the nature of exponential change. This is going to continue, and you're going to see massive amounts of change coming to the transportation sector and every other sector as a result. All right, so that's my softening you up to get you to expect some weird stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to show you some things in the rest of my time with you that I hope will both surprise you and also help you avoid being surprised in the future. Because you're going to see some things, you go, no, no, that's not possible. You're not going to do that. So my goal is to show you some things in that realm. But I, I'm going to do that because when you're thinking about this stuff and thinking about your plans and what's possible in the next five or ten years, I want you to not be surprised by what's coming. I don't want you to be caught out and think, God, if only if we'd listened to Steve back in 2015, we'd be in a much better place now here in 2025 or 2020 for that matter. So don't be surprised. This stuff is coming, and it will come at a surprising rate because it is exponential change. So what's Moore's Law going to give us in the next decade? It's going to give us three things. And for those of you who are, you know, like structure in your lives, this is my structure for this talk. The three things are that, first of all, computing is going to continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Computing is going to head towards zero. What I mean by that is zero cost, zero physical size, zero power consumption. It won't be zero, but it'll get closer and closer to it. What that allows you to do is to make everything in the world smart. Smart cars, smart roads, smart everything. Smart objects, smart infrastructure. The second thing it will let you do is smart sensing. This idea that there will be sensors in everything, and those sensors are going to get ever more sophisticated. You have sensors in your phone today, accelerometers and gyroscopes and that sort of thing. I'm talking about way more advanced sensing than that. That's going to enable a whole new set of natural interfaces, and we'll talk about what that means. It has a very big impact for self-driving cars. In fact, it's the key enabler for self-driving cars. The third thing is that as well as computers getting incredibly small and heading towards zero size, zero cost, zero power consumption, they're also being put together into massive computing installations that would completely fill this room and many, of, of them over, no, many times over. These are the types of computing installations that are the backbone of Google and Yahoo and Amazon and all of those types of companies. They're also the sorts of installations you should be thinking about as part of ODOT's infrastructure for the future. You shouldn't just be building roads, you should be building computing infrastructure that's going to help you manage the traffic flow on those roads. I'm sure you have some stuff already, but the opportunity for you here is huge. And it's also potentially the key to you solving your funding problems. I'll leave that hanging in the air. So the next decade, computing getting smaller, at the, paradoxically at the same time, bigger and more powerful, and all of it connected via um, lots of sensors that enable computers to interact the, with the world in a very different way. So let's start with smart everything. What happens once every object in our world becomes smart? Now on the surface, this is a hard concept to wrap your head around. Well, why would I make an object smart? I want to illustrate a point and talk about smart products to sort of bring this to life for you. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is um, a simple, fun example that makes the idea accessible, and then I'm going to do one that's related to transportation. So the first one, let's talk about this smart teddy bear. What if I could make my teddy bear smart? What could I do with that? 
what if I could make my teddy bear not only smart, but be able to see the world around it? Because in the next 10 years, computers will finally be able to see, hear, and understand the world for the first time. Up till now, computers have been blind and deaf. Suddenly, that's going to change. So maybe I could use my teddy bear to read a book to a child. Now, those of you that are parents, that's your job, to read a book to a child. It's part of bonding with your kid. It's an enjoyable experience. The first four times you do it. <laughs> Daddy, will you read it again? Oh, let's have Bearsy do it. So maybe you can hand over to Bear. And the bear can read the book for the fifth time and the sixth time. And maybe because the bear's connected to the internet and has access to translation capabilities beyond your wildest dreams, maybe they can take that English book and now the bear can read it to your kid in French or Arabic, Chinese, whatever language you like. Now, how much is a bear like that worth? I don't know. $59.99? Any, anybody? $59.99? Maybe, maybe that's what it's worth. Maybe it's worth 60 bucks. Or maybe you could sell it for $19.99, but the reading service, now that's $5 a month. So suddenly, you can start to think about new business models, new ways of monetizing that resource, that technology that you developed. Maybe the second language. So if you want French, it's $5 a month. If you want another language, it's another $5 a month. Now I'll cut your deal, $3 a month. What this does is it changes the way people think about products, both from the people making them and the people consuming them. Because smart, making an object smart changes it forever. It's completely transformational. It lets you do new things to provide new value. A teddy bear that was great for cuddling before, still great for cuddling, also now reads books. Maybe it also watches your house while you're away and reports to you if someone you know, comes into your house. You can start to think about all kinds of services you could sell over that thing. So that product has now become a service. It is a service that you pay for on a monthly basis. That enables complete new sets of business models. How could you do that? How could you monetize the infrastructure that you have in different ways? We'll talk about that in a minute. But it also potentially increases access for people. If a teddy bear costs $19.99, that's more accessible than $59.99. And I can price my reading service based on ability to pay if I want to. So when I sell into different markets to different types of people, I can price at different levels. So you can increase access to technology, to products, to information, to services, and price them in different ways for different people. Now, I said I'd give you a transportation example as well as the silly uh, smart teddy bear. How many of you have experienced this when driving down the street? Someone coming the other direction with their brights on, not paying attention, hadn't seen you, blinds you. So you're driving along, we're we gonna get past it, you're trying to focus, look beyond the light, your family's in the back, we're all gonna die, and you're past. Whew, we made it. Wouldn't it be nice if your headlight was able to help you with that? Now, headlights on your car have not changed much in about 130 years of motoring. They're still, um, you know, a filament in a vacuum that uh, is surrounded by a mirror that helps project the light forward in front of the car to help you see where you're going. It hasn't really changed much. Halogen, if you have one of those fancy cars, then as you turn the steering wheel, you know, your, your lights move. Big deal. Nice, but I'm talking about making this stuff, stuff seriously smart. So what if I could make my headlight smart? What if I could make it smart? What would that look like? What would that feel like? Now, at this point, I'm expecting the blank expressions I see on most of your faces. This is the right response. What are you talking about, Steve? I don't get it. And I had the exact same response when I heard this example the first time around. I thought, what? Let me show you what I mean. What if my car, because it's now, remember, my car can now see. Computers are cheap. Computers can see. Now I can see the car coming the opposite direction. I can recognize, oh, that's a car. If I replace that filament inside a mirror with a high-powered projector, I can tell that projector where to aim the light. 
I can aim the light around the car coming the other way. I can have my brights on the entire time. Sounds futuristic, I know. You could even go further than that. If you wanted to, you could have a camera that looked out of the front of your car that watched the raindrops, and we have plenty of those here in Oregon, that's for sure. Watch those raindrops falling out of the sky. Now today, when you drive in rain, if you have your headlights on, the light bounces back off the raindrops because raindrops are little prisms, and they, they fire the light everywhere, including back at you, so it's harder to see. But if you could do that, you could have a camera look at those raindrops, watch them falling, send that information to a computer because your headlight is now smart, doesn't cost much to do that. And you can predict using that computer where are the raindrops going to be next. Once you figure that out, you can send that information to the projector in the form of a mat. So you're actually sending an image to project out of the front of the car so that light goes around and between the raindrops. Did I just blow your mind? Yeah. Now, this sounds far-fetched. Does it sound far-fetched and stupid and crazy? It's okay, I can take it. Not anymore, yeah. This is something that is a project that was run between Intel and Carnegie Mellon University four or five years ago, and it works. It works well, not just in rain, but also in snow. And I'm gonna show you a video so you can see what it looks like. So you'll see here, system's not switched on, lots of snow, and then click. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It makes quite a difference, and it's, it's pretty hard. I mean, raindrops fall in mostly straight lines. Snow, as you've seen from the Charlie Brown Christmas specials, does this. So this is difficult. Now, this is on early hardware, four or five years ago with early software. It's a lot better now. So now do you understand what I mean when I say make objects in your life smart? What would you do if they are smart? So hopefully that smart headlight now makes sense. What are the objects in your transportation networks, or the objects in the way that you do your business that you could make smart, and how would that change what you do? Because smart is becoming an ingredient.